Fabio, over to you. Ready to go, yes. OK, thanks for having me. Um, so this is me and uh, my student, Sam. He graduated a couple of years ago. He's uh, in uh, Cambridge doing his master's. He also had an offer from Oxford. And uh, this was the first Viva I actually had. Um, so you actually see my office, and I'm recording this with my laptop camera uh, for quality purposes. But of course, um, pictures that you see of people that have agreed uh, to, uh, to be uh, displayed. So, um, so as Gwen has said, um, I, I work uh, in the School of Economics, University of East Anglia. I'm a teaching director uh, there. And I'm interested in uh, higher education policy and practice. So um, the closest I get to economics these days is looking at widening assets, how to help students get into education. And of course, uh, the tools that I use are more quantitative than qualitative because of my training. But today, I'm going to I'm going to talk about the qualitative piece. And that's the reason why I always pair up with somebody else who's uh, more knowledgeable than me in qualitative research. In this case, it's Naomi Winston. I'm going to tell you a bit, little bit more uh, about her when we get to the point. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm very much in interested into that. Um, I've done a lot of work on self-assessment and self-efficacy. So um, my initial work was about giving students the confidence of uh, achieving academically. And I strongly believe that uh, uh, still a lot needs to be done um, about this. So um, since Gwen told already about my uh, tweeting uh, engagements, uh, this is my Twitter handle. And please feel free to follow and interact with me. and. Uh, um, ask questions and challenge what I say. Um, it's always a pleasure. Um, so what I would like to do today is telling you about this um, assessment that I implemented in my um, undergraduate module. Um, and um, I will tell you a little bit about how to do it. And, and, and of course, uh, you can ask further questions about what picks your fancy. So um, I might whisk quite quickly through the slides about how to do it. Because I would rather you guys ask me, ask me questions about what you are interested in. Of course, uh, some of the information is also specific to UEA. Um, but then what I want to do is actually showing you what happened with a preliminary evaluation that I did a couple of years ago. And uh, um, the proper research that I started last year, we're still collecting data. We need a, a few um, cohorts in order to be able to uh, run a proper assessment. But um, uh, feedback, always welcome, um, as well, new ideas. Um, so. Let me tell you a little bit about um, Viva Voce um, exams. And the first thing I need to do is positioning myself. I'm Italian, as you uh, can pick from my accent. Um, and I took my first degree in an Italian university. So this is uh, um, the crest of my alma mater. This is the crown of Charlemagne, because Pavia, the university I come from, was the capital of, uh, of his empire. Um, one of the first universities in, um, in the Italian um, uh, territory. And um, so what's going on in, in Italian universities? Well, I haven't been there for 20 years, but um, I can tell you uh, lit very little has changed. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> the approach is very didactic, most certainly much more than what we do here in the UK. So um, we don't have small group teaching seminars uh, where you have interactions are not a very common practice. I don't want to say that there are uh, not existent, but uh, like ma more, more, more certainly less spread than here. But in my opinion, there is something that is working very well there, or at least a tool that offers opportunities. And then you know, it depends on how you use it. And the tool is Viva Voce exams. So in my first four-year undergrad program in economics, um, I uh, had a written assessment and an oral assessment for every single component of my degree, starting off with mathematics. So even in mathematics, which was, was, was my first exam, I had a written part where I had to study functions, uh, solve equations, and then an oral part where I will sit in front of my lecturer and go through my script and being asked to prove theorems on the spot. Yeah? And I strongly believe that this is the added value that um, Italian University um, uh, has given me, you know, and which compensated for the kind of didactic approach that I um, uh, had to uh, en engage with uh, for my degree. So this ability of uh, uh, discussing with my lecturers, and which is also a privilege. Whenever in your life you actually have a chance you know, to sit in front of somebody and I'm in a conversation. Uh, of course, I did it for my Viva Voce when I graduated from my PhD. But I had a lot of these experiences before. And, um, and I think it's this is really great. So um, my claim is that we should make better use of oral assessment um, in uh, the uh, United Kingdom. And by oral assessment, I don't just mean a presentation. 
but um, a viva is uh, something different. So I always tell my, um, my colleagues, you know, just imagine there is a spectrum, and the presentation is um, a situation where the students, you know, is given a brief, but then it's got basically full control. And then on the spectrum, you, you, you can balance the amount of questions and challenge that you can give the students, so you move along the spectrum, and then you bring into a viva where basically the weight should be 50-50, and, and there is a 50-50 exchange between uh, you and the students. Um, so uh, my invitation is like, let's move on the spectrum somewhere, but closer to this idea of training students to have a conversation rather than just a presentation. Um, so the module uh, where I applied this, uh, a history economic thought module. So as you can imagine, uh, in economics we got a lot of technical uh, modules where we teach maths and stats and uh, formulae, um, diagrammatic analysis. This is probably the closest you get to your humanities in an economics degree. Um, I absolutely love it. Um, my training in Italy was very much according to a historical perspective, so I actually campaigned to have this module uh, opened and I'm running it. Uh, so it's been running for, uh, this is my third year, so there was a huge surge, 70 students, and then it went down to 50, now uh, around 30 students, which I think is we are, we are reaching plateau, and um, that's fine, or perhaps the students got scared about um, my, uh, uh, my uh, demands, but um, that, 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 that is absolutely fine. Um, so give a couple of lectures a week, and then we go a seminar every second week. Um, I really like students to actually uh, read a lot from the original texts. So I just engage with them to that extent. For those who are curious, these are the kind of authors that I cover in my module, but that is not relevant to the presentation. So my challenge was, this is a non-technical exam. So a, a closed book, exam conditions kind of environment is absolutely inappropriate to assess. Um, I, will ha I hate the idea that, you know, that I, 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 I write down questions in January for something that is going to take place in May, and um, my students will have to cram everything the night before, or possibly two nights before, if you've been uh, a bit generous with time, and then vomit on a piece of paper in a couple of hours. It's just not what I want to happen, and it's completely pointless. So I said, no, um, we, 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 just need, we just need better assessment. Um, so, um, so what about Viva Voce assessment? Not very much used, as you probably have experienced. <laughs> um, so Dai Ansel um, and others have conducted a survey of different assessment methods, uh, um, and, 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 and they just basically observe the fact that all sorts of oral assessments are pretty much based on presentation, but that's the only thing that you have. You know? So Viva Voce at an undergraduate level is really not used. There are a few examples. And so I picked some examples that I found across different disciplines. Um, this one is about mathematics, and Paola Iannone uh, used to be a colleague of mine, now she's in uh, Lofra. And the, the reason why I particularly like uh, Paola's paper is uh, the fact that she investigates the reason why this is the case. Why is Viva not um, so widespread? So it's really worthwhile reading, if, even if you don't have a particular interest in, uh, in maths. And basically their argument is a nutshell, is that the kind of like written assessment was driven by the Oxford and Cambridge paradigm. And, 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 and this university basically dictated you know, and set the standards for assessment the way we know it in the UK nowadays. Yeah? But it can be challenged, and most certainly I'm doing it. Yeah? Um, so the problem is that we don't know much about it. It's not conceptualized. There is not much in the literature. Most certainly not much in the literature at undergraduate level. So talk about supporting our postgraduate research students are going through the virus, but there is not much done on undergrad whatsoever. Yeah? I will also argue that it's very much needed. Um, so coming from my own discipline, but I'm sure that uh, um, many colleagues from different disciplines can sympathize, um, it emerges that you know, um, our kids coming out from economics degrees, they actually learn their technical skills, and they master them pretty well, they know software, they analyze the data, they really struggle to communicate to non-economists. So we make them so well that then, the, you know, we kind of bring them back to the real world. <laughs> um, and another skill that is very much in need is creativity and uh, imaginative powers. You know. so, like, um, how do we bring our students to actually re-engage with the real world and be creative? Yeah? They, they are going to find themselves in a job and, 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 and expect it to be independent and just coming up with their own ideas and conveying them to teams coming with different expertise, yeah? So um, I believe that Viva Voce is actually a solution to this, uh, to this problem, yeah? So 
how can we possibly get close to a job interview if not during the viva? Robin, do you have a question? Fabio, just because you mentioned Oxford Cambridge, and maybe you'll come back to this later. Sure. It's kind of ironic that it's also the university where for most subjects there is a bigger budget interview to get in. <laughs> and then for three years, there's quite a lot of viva voce tutorial close yes. work of one to one or three, four, five to one, and then the examination goes. Yeah. The, the, you know, at least the students there, they get this kind of interaction with the tutorial model. Uh, but in, in other institutions, they don't even get that. So they only got the final examination in the end, you know. So, so but you'll come back later, I'm sure, to the notion of training both on, on both sides of the, of the equation, both sides of market. Absolutely. the market. Absolutely. The training, that, yeah. Absolutely, Involved yes. Being able to conduct this on both sides. And I tell you, it's a little bit of learning by doing, because of course, you know, um, I just have to experiment. <laughs> um, but I'm going to get there. So just to reinforce, I mean, um, uh, Jonathan Atto is now deputy uh, at the uh, uh, Office for National Statistics, and he's a UEA graduate, so he comes and visits us quite often. And, and, and you know, I, I, I think that what he says is, is pretty striking. And once again, I don't believe it's only applicable to economics. I think that a lot of us can actually sympathize with what he says. You know, so like, you know, independently from our subject knowledge, are we able to send out graduates that are able to have a conversation <laughs> and explain what they're doing to people who are not expert? Um, I think this is quite important. So let me tell you um, how I decided to design assessment in my module then. So scrap final exam. I don't want to see the final exam in a closed book uh, kind of environment. No. Yeah. So um, this simple scheme is telling you I got three pieces of assessments. These are the weights. And this is the kind of assessment I give, and these are the learning outcomes for each piece. Yeah? So we start off with a group video presentation. Um, so students have to come together in a group. They choose their own topic. They come and discuss that with me. And then uh, off they go. They do some research and produce a video of 10 minutes length. And then I can actually mark that. And uh, the advantage of producing a video is just like staying within a, a limited time, using media, so using different medias to be able to communicate. And it's working very well. I was actually quite worried um, about the video. Uh, but of course, you know, um, in terms of technology, they're savvier than me. And I had no queries whatsoever. I didn't tell them much about how to do it. They just come back with amazing results. So uh, absolutely no worry. Um, and I will say, I mean, this is pro possibly the piece of assessment that stands uh, a little bit on its own. What is nice is they start to get trained in doing research. I, I show them how to go and of course, I expect them to go beyond the textbook, beco be beyond handouts, so that I point them to, I don't know, Scopus is the kind of resource that we use to search for academic papers in social sciences. Uh, so they get acquainted with that, you know. But the nice thing starts here. So um, second part of the module, they have to write a critical essay. So it's already quite a lot of challenge uh, about, you know, showing them what and teaching them what being critical is. So providing them some resources, videos, guidelines, um, I want them to choose their own essay topic, but for those who, can, who are really desperate, I also provide a couple of topics they can pick up. They are rewarded according to the challenge they decide to take up for themselves. Um, and, and of course, this is their academic piece. They do research, and once again, I expect them to ask an, in an interesting and intelligent question and go away from textbook and slides. Um, what I do, I provide them loads and loads of feedback. So the uh, the amount of feedback that I provide for this piece most certainly outweighs everything else that happens in the module. But the feedback I provide here is actually feeding in the evaluative conversation that takes place at the end. So students are going to go away with the feedback. They will have to think about that, and they will have to respond to it. And, and then we're going to have a one-to-one -one conversation. Uh, it's going to take place in my office. And, um, and here is when we debate um, uh, about uh, concepts that we covered in the module. The first 50% of the VIVA is uh, discussing the essay. So I reproduce this idea that, you know, um, um, like what I used to do in Italy, you know, that you bring your script to the oral exam and, and you actually discuss the script for the first part, and I think it's really productive. And then in the second part, I can pick absolutely anything uh, on the syllabus and ask them about that. But obviously, uh, it I'm not going to ask uh, the date of birth of, or like the year of death of different uh, thinkers. I really don't care about that. 
So my question can be quite broad. And I say, OK, Leon, if you talk about theory of value, how would you compare these three authors? What do you think their contribution is? Or like, if I put two boxes here and I say pro-intervention or no intervention, um, I shoot at you names of, a, of thinkers, put them in one of the two boxes, and the important thing is that you tell me why. Yeah? So these are the kind of questions that I ask. Like, um, so I want to see reasoning. I want to see reasoning. Um, very nice thing is uh, that uh, front-loading feedback uh, at, th at this stage, students have to do something with it. You know? So another thing that I'm trying to um, prevent, and this is where Naomi Winston comes into the picture, is this idea of you know, providing feedback that, that students can use for something. Yeah? Providing feedback only at the end, or feedback that is not useful for students to do something, is not very helpful in my opinion, and it shouldn't be done. So, uh, students are going to get some feedback from the Viva, but it's, it's going to be uh, very uh, basic, because the feedback is already taking place as we have in a conversation. They perfectly know what's going on, and, and my feedback is coming across verbally, on my facial expressions probably, <laughs> and, and, and that. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, I think uh, um, this is a satisfactory design. No final exam, just coursework with these three pieces. Yeah. So how do I do it? Um, video presentation, I was already mentioning, I allocate students in groups. Uh, they choose their own uh, topic. This is our learning technologies group is uh, supporting um, that. Um, are you using Blackboard, Moodle? Moodle? Moodle, yeah. So well, Blackboard is our Moodle. Um, um, provide some guidelines, but students pick up their own software. So they don't even care about what I tell them. Um, and they just come back with some amazing. I, I had videos where uh, students blended slides with them appearing in different locations on campus and words editing on the, on the blue sky in the background, which was absolutely incredible. I had a students who actually can sketch very well, and they went on a vignette, kind of. So people were narrating, and somebody was actually sketching things as the narration was going along. Uh, I was mind blown by how good they were. So, um, and once again, very little support. I was very worried when I, when I introduced this, feedback, uh, this uh, assessment. Um, I got a rubric online. I just marked them, provide some feedback, and done. You know? So very, very simple to mark as well. Um, and also, I like this idea of you know, making assessment sustainable, um, which is uh, very important uh, indeed. So essay. Probably this is the, the piece that takes me the most uh, effort. So students submit their uh, essay online. Um, I prefer um, editing in words, uh, editing tools. Uh, now, now we are moving to Turnitin is a bit better, but Blackboard uh, marking was a bit of a nightmare. Word, it's easy. Um, I provide them with loads and loads of feedback. And I provide them with three points I want them to address in their, in their Viva. So the first point is mostly look at the corrections and challenges that I gave you. And you can respond, hands up, you were right, or well, I thought about it, and I meant this one was not very clear. Or I did some more research, and now I see what you mean, but x, y, and z. Um, two, where I, you know, I try to bring them uh, a bit farther. And I say, OK, you spoke about this author, but this other one considered this problem as well. Um, how will you go about comparing them? Yeah? And then the third questions, I try and pull them even further afield. And I say, well, like just catching an argument from a bigger perspective. So, so there, are, there is a sort of gradient, and little by little, I just get away from their essay, and I prepare them from the second part of the Bible where I can go wherever I want. Um, so, um, so students receive their feedback, and they prepare for the conversation. And then, my pride and joy. Um, I, uh, I set out an Excel spreadsheet uh, with uh, my calendar. I block times so that I have committees and other stuff. Um, when I had 70 students, I had to spread it over two weeks. I can handle maximum 10 vivas a day, and I'm, then I head straight to the pub. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, if you do that, please uh, time yourself to get uh, a lunch break and toilet breaks. Um, <laughs> because I did very little of it the first time, and uh, <laughs> it, it was challenging. It was really challenging. So I booked myself for 30 minutes, lots of students after students. And 20 minutes will be the Viva. 15, 20 minutes is the Viva. 10 minutes to type the feedback. And you have to write it on the spot, otherwise you're going to forget. But once again, the feedback is not going to take as much of your time, because a lot of the feedback takes place in the conversation itself. 
So I have a rubric. Um, just going to fill in my rubric. A couple of comments on what went well, a couple of comments on what needs improvement. And um, already typed in, so they're ready to be moderated and off to the next. Yeah? Um, Viva take place uh, with the students agreeing to be recorded. If they don't agree to be recorded, they are warned that, that uh, quality assurance might be compromised and is at, at their own risk. Um, their video uh, is just going to feed straight on Blackboard. So at the end of the day, I record all this video. We have this stream, which is basically a private YouTube. Uh, and, and so these videos feed in their own um, uh, grading center. So each student can see the, their own videos. They can see the rubric and can they can see my comments straight away. Well, straight away at the, at the end of the at the end of the assessment. Uh, the moderator, of course, can log in there, look at the videos, look at the rubrics as well. External examiners can do exactly the same. So, in terms of quality assurance, there are really no problems. Could be the same as the video presentation. For them, it's exactly the same thing. They look at the video and they look at the feedback I given. So, no problem. Yeah. Um, so quite a rigid schedule of this uh, 30 minutes uh, um, uh, along uh, two weeks for 70 students. Uh, this year with 30 students, I think in one week I'm going to be more than, um, uh, it's going to be more than enough to actually com complete all the vivas. And, um, and that's me done, basically. So um, what we've done with the students is coming up with a rubric. Every year we review the rubric uh, together. Um, so I asked the students what they think, what they thought when we started this module. What they thought we uh, would uh, need to assess and what they would like to receive feedback upon. And they came up with this criteria. Of course, the first one is the response to feedback because the first part of the Viva is engaging with their feedback. So they get graded according to that. Their ability to link theories, that to me is very important. So just like jumping from one theory to the other and see links, comparing, going across different authors. Um, this one uh, is uh, the one they performed the worst on average, which is, of course, involving me um, you know, asking questions all across the spectrum. I absolutely hate this culture of past papers and what I should study and what should I forget. Um, to me, this doesn't exist. And to be honest with you, I apply the same uh, even in my introductory macroeconomics module with 250 students. I'm very, very clear that whatever, you know, they have to prepare on absolute everything. And I'm very rigid on that. So this is the point on which we have more frictions, you know? And some students you still get back to me and say, it's like, oh, but you asked me a lot of things that I didn't know. It's your choice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, I expect my students to be uh, clear to use appropriate jargon when the need uh, arises, but also to be able to, uh, you know, explain things uh, um, in a clear and approachable way. So uh, propri property of jargon and clarity to me is, is essential. Um, as a non-native speaker, I would also like to use this opportunity to challenge um, rubrics that talk about good English. Define good English. Is my English good? Yes, no, probably not good enough. I'm not native, I'm never going to be a native. Uh, do we allow international students, so students whose first language is not English, to come to our universities? Yes. Do we say that we are fit, they are fit to actually study with us? Yes. Is their English good? Never going to be like a native. So I rule out any kind of comments related to good English. And mind you, when I moved to the UK, I had a chip on my shoulder. So I was even harsher than a native speaker when I was marking students. You know, it's like, this is not good enough. Um, no, that's not correct. To me, it's all about clarity. If, uh, if a student is able to use jargon and be clear, explaining themselves, then I can forgive and forget uh, about grammar mistakes as they forgive mine. Um, and I think this is an important principle. Yep? Because what you're talking about is from the markers and uh, pe penalizing students for, for not using their English well enough yep. uh, in that sense. But in terms of accessing um, uh, like the ability to produce the language, to be mm. able to uh, take fully part inside of that. Mm. So, so at, at your university, so you've got an entry requirement of IELTS 6.5 yeah. with the lowest, that's 5.5. Yeah. Mm. What is your experience with the students on the lower end of that spectrum and how they perform inside of something like this? I have no experience because in economics we, are, we ask for a 6.5. Overall? <clears throat> yes, we raise the bar. Okay. We raise the bar. Absolutely. 
and, 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 and so would you say that this actually for the lower language, um, so if, if that was lower, so if it was... I believe there is more a problem with the lecturer than with the students. You know, the, 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 you know, the, the level can be whatever your institution decides, decided to be, but then you, know, you have to be coherent and fair to these people. You know, so what, whatever you set the bar is a matter of you know, students being able to engage at that level and, and, and convey a message. If I can understand what you say, even if you say are rather than is or something like that, that's fine by me. Obviously, there are needs related to jargon in economics. I mean, if you call a concept another concept, I had a colleague having a discussion with me in biology, and I said, if you call a, a, an enzyme an, another name, you know, you're making a huge mistake. If you are a pharmacist, uh, you, you use the wrong terminology and, and you put people at, uh, at you know, threat of life, that is not acceptable, of course. You know. But when it comes to conversation, you can make concessions on, on grammatic rules. That, that is the only point that I'm making. I guess it links to this, but it may be something you want to address later when you talk about evaluating sure. the whole thing. And that is, is there a, are you noticing a systematic difference in performance or even now in the probability of taking this module <coughs> across different types of yeah. students in ways which might link with language? Ends up. When uh, I saw, um, so in economics we have quite a high proportion of Chinese students coming to um, take our degrees. And when I saw that uh, you know, there was quite a high proportion of Chinese students, and there is every year, so actually I got uh, quite a lot of international overseas students, I was really worried. And I said, perhaps they're making the wrong choice. And I'm ashamed to say that I was completely wrong. Um, because once I actually clarified this point to them, and especially to myself, these students actually performed very well. And the feedback they gave me is just like, I like history. And I said, well, yeah, why you shouldn't like history? You know, it's like the stereotype that the Chinese students only like maths. It's not true. Um, and they came to me and said, I like history. So why not? Yes, you like history. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and that's absolutely fine. Confidence. Yes. What sure. I find quite striking is you go through the rubrics and the outcomes that your 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 assessment Absolutely. criteria with the students. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, they influence it. Yeah, yeah. The students. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And every year we yeah. review that. I so think I think that that's a so that's we had a we had a part where the strength comes from. Absolutely. We had a further criterion that, that we decided to discard, and, and it was about the political and context. And to be honest with you, yeah, it, it can be relevant, but it depends where the viva goes. Yeah. And, and also, there is su such little time that I'm actually more interested in getting the economic concepts going on. You know? so, so we just said, OK, let's, let's forget about this. You know? But the students were cons consulted on the name of the module. Um, they were consulted on the format of assessment. So I started to talk to the students the year before I actually opened the module. And history economic thought was not my choice, for instance. My choice was uh, uh, um, history had methods of economic thinking, and but they were scared that methods was going to be a technical module, and I didn't think about that because it was not in, in my you know to me you know methods were talking about philosophy of science, but it wasn't in their mind. And I said, okay, fine. If you don't like this, and you prefer this other name, we'll just do another this other name. Yes. Uh, 20 minutes. Do you find that that's really enough? Because I I, I don't know how many yeah. issues you can really discuss yeah. with somebody in 20 minutes. I mean, I, I do a similar with 20 minutes and yeah. 10 minutes, but I just fucked that out of the air. So it's reassuring just to yeah. see that <laughs> you've got 20 minutes as well. But my big concern is always, 20 minutes isn't really very long I, for, you know, to get a decent conversation going. I, I, I started off with 20 minutes, and I have to say, last year I actually went down to 15, because I thought that I could actually cover a lot. Um, and of course, there are reasonable adjustments um, that I take into account, and I apply exactly the same rule they apply for um, essay variety in our exams. You know. So if you go, I don't know, um, a percentage uh, more time, I apply that to the timing of the Viva. Uh, for some of them, if they have severe dyslexia, for instance, I write down the questions and I put the, the paper in front of them so they can actually read them out rather than just listening to me. And, and let's say with, the, with uh, overseas students, and I just make sure that I slow down when I speak. And I, you know, the thing is that you know, my English is quite fluent. I don't know whether it's good, uh, once again, but it's, it's very fast uh, because Italians tend to speak very fast. And so it's like my, my job is always trying to slow down <laughs> and make sure that I'm very clear when I ask questions. And that's something that I need to work on every time. Confidence. I don't, um, I don't set specific weights on this. And I will never dare to say that I, you know, if you're not confident, I'm going to mark you down. But students, I, I, and, and confidence is something that, I'm, as I told you, you know, I really care about. But it was the students who asked me this. You know, the students asked me to put this, uh, this criterion within their um, evaluation grid. So it's more for them to get feedback than me 
giving them a mark about it. Um, and and I, I mean, I, I, I keep quite a fluid approach. You know? um, uh, uh, so these are the criteria, but they're not weighted. They get the feedback. But when I think about a mark, I think about a mark thinking about the overall experience. And, and I know that this perhaps uh, you know, is open to criticism. But in my opinion, being far too rigid, uh, especially with the Viva Voce conversation that can go all over the places, is not the best approach. So once you've got an idea about what you want to think about, that's enough to actually guide your judgment, in my opinion. But do please, please, uh, feel free to challenge me. So this is my office. Um, I uh, enjoy quite a big one. I don't know for how long. Um, <laughs> so this is a, uh, we are running out of space. Um, so students uh, sit here, I sit here, and this is where the conversation takes place. Um, I had uh, students coming to me and say, I'm really nervous. And I said, well, come to my office, come to office hours. And you know, they come over, and I just say, you're going to be sitting here, I'm going to be sitting here. This is what is going to happen. And that's really, really helpful. You know? But that is it's quite common. You know? um, now I'm, uh, I'm quite enjoying talking, as you have noticed. And I'm feeling quite comfortable with that. But when I started to give talks, um, I would make a point of going to the room, you know, just check with the equipment, make sure that I own the space and I know where I'm going to stand. And uh, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's very important. You know? So the students are offered precisely that. And I had, I had a Chinese students coming to me and say, well, I'm really nervous because, uh, you know, because English is not my first language. And I would say, well, English is not my first language. And, and she looked at me and I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> and she did absolutely amazing. She was great. She was really, really good. Um, so what happened? So I asked the students a lot of questions, gave me feedback. Uh, I asked them what they thought uh, about the conversation. How did it go before giving them the marks? So they filled up a form. They submitted the form to the general office. So it was all ethically tested, and I wouldn't see this matched to names. But then I actually matched all the demographics later on with our names at the end of my assessment. If you have uh, any questions about ethics, I can clarify that. I'm very well trained with the actual research. So, um, so so um, students were uh, overall um, uh, quite all right. So the majority of them uh, told me that uh, he, he went quite all right to like 30% for a, for, for, a, for a 70 students class. That's all right, yeah. Um, but they were very, very happy with the module. So I, I, I could see with that. You know? So probably even students who said the conversation didn't go that well, they were happy with the module. Um, and these are some of the quotes that I got from the first year. And um, I love this uh, student. Um, she didn't perform very well. She was really nervous. She was on the, on the verge of fears uh, during the session. And I guided her through. And, and I loved it because at the end she said, you know, yeah, it didn't go well. She know. She knew that it didn't go well. But she said, but now I know how to do it. And I said, well, good, because the next time you do it is your job interview. So fantastic. You know, you have to expose to yourself to this. So, um, so, you know, a lot of comments are like, this was the scariest thing that I've ever done in my life. And I said, well, good. You know, it's about time that you get challenged. And, and then you get out there and, 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 and do well. You know, my, the challenge for me is making sure that I scaffold you. Uh, and and, 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 and I, I, I just avoid to expose you to such a huge different setup compared to the one that you are um, used to operate. And these are suggestions the students were actually giving to other students um, about, about the Viva. So I have uh, an innate passion for cows. This is the background in my office, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you about that another time. Um, um, peaceful animals. Um, uh, <laughs> um, colleagues will say, you are absolutely nuts. You're going to waste a lot of time doing all these vivas. And yes, your diary looks absolutely scary when you look at it. But if you think about the effort that you need to put when you mark essays, not much more. 20 minutes for a Viva, 10 minutes to write the feedback, and you're done. So I will do my 9 to 5, head to the pub, and my day is over, and I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to mark a pile of essays. And then you know what it happens. You probably share the feeling. You're just going to have a chocolate, and then you're going to have a cup of coffee, and then count how many papers you have there. It takes forever. It takes forever. It's just that perhaps you're doing a tome, you're doing a Saturday and Sunday, which is spoiling your weekend. Um, the effective time that you actually invest in doing this kind of assessment is exactly the same, if not less, than marking an essay, if you do it properly. Yeah? I would say marking a 2,000 words, 3,000 word essay shouldn't take you less than 15 minutes or 20 minutes. Yeah? Um, and it's really lovely that I could actually interface with my students one-to-one. -one. 
you know, and just adapt my questions and adapt the session to them rather than adapt it to me. So, um, so I reiterate, you know, I, I, I believe this, uh, this is really working. And then I partner up uh, with Nomi, who's the queen of uh, feedback. She's fantastic. Uh, so, so she's written a lot on these uh, ideas of you know, making feedback meaningful, making feedback useful for something, making feedback actionable. Um, and it's, she recently published a book on, on these concepts as well. You know, so assessment literacy, feedback literacy, and how to make use of feedback. Um, so she's the perfect per person to work uh, within this kind of environment. So we matched uh, a lot of students' evaluations. We ran um, um, orientation scales, so, so we measure our students, what's a student's attitude towards feedback, um, and how they're predisposed to uh, uh, take it on board. And we are researching on, you know, how can we help students to uh, make the most out of the evaluative conversation, how to scaffold the process, and whether students are actually uh, experiencing difficulty in taking feedback on board and, and what happens in, uh, in, uh, um, in the Viva setup. So what has happened uh, over last year? Um, some data still need to be analyzed. Um, so we got demographics we are controlling also for this uh, native, non-native, uh, um, uh, previous British educations versus not, um, self-evaluations as well, and the feedback scale. They are currently um, creating a new scale which is uh, much more closer to this idea of feedback literacy. Yeah? So this is the best uh, tool that we can use at the moment, but uh, David Carles, who's working in partnership with Naomi Wiston, they are actually looking into creating a scale about feedback literacy, and that will be even more appropriate. So this is going to come very soon. Um, so these are some of the demographics out of uh, 50 students managed to get 30 responses, so it's not that I can do fancy statistical modeling here. Uh, but at least I got this representation from different groups. I know this is not decent in general, but for economics it's very decent, because uh, especially at UEA we have a quite low rate of female to male um, uh, participation. So we have 25, 75, the sector is 30%. Uh, so, um, so we had females there, we had uh, international students, non-native speakers, and even students visiting from other schools as well. Um, and once again, you know, so in, s in terms of self-assessment last year, 60% of the students told me that they felt the conversation went as expected or better than expected. I'm quite happy with that. And students thought the module well as expected or better than expected overall, so they were quite happy as well. So, you know, these two together, fine by me. I'm done feel the urge of changing anything just because of student concerns. Of course, I just want to improve the way I do things. But even more interesting was uh, to see uh, the narrative. So just looking at their self-evaluation and yeah, going deeper and asking them, why, wh why do you say it went well? Why do you say it didn't go well? And, and so some, some themes have been emerging. Yeah? And so very important one, to they were talking about their anxiety or their confidence during the session. Um, um, they were talking about the preparation, especially those who didn't perform very well or felt that they didn't perform very well. They were talking about the preparation. Um, different items related to the challenge. So the time, some of them felt it was going too fast and uh, they didn't have a chance to think uh, about, uh, about what to say. Uh, they didn't know what was going to happen. Um, but um, this is of course, the, the most reassuring one, a lot of students actually mentioned the support they received. So um, students, uh, they actually have an, uh, exemplars of essays, exemplars of presentations, and I had some students who actually agreed for their video vivas to be shared with other students, and that, I think, is the most important thing. So when I start the module, I actually share all this, all the piece of assessment. They can actually see everything to begin with. They can make their choice because I don't know how it works at work. The first two years, the students can change optional modules, so they can shop around and make a decision. And then, second week, le the lock comes, and you're in, you're in, you're out, you're out. Yeah. So they can make all the choices. Um, and um, if you, uh, as I said, I cannot conduct uh, um, a very sophisticated modeling, but some sort of pattern seems uh, emerging in the data. So, so those who talk about um, confidence. So we're talking about confidence and anxiety. So a lot of people that actually did well, they were talking about their, their, their feelings confident about the task. And the one talking about 
things not going that well, they were more talking about their preparation and the fact that they didn't engage with the material, they didn't do the, do the reading and so on and so forth. So this seems like sort of saying, well, if it went well, thanks to you, and if, it if I did bad, it's my fault, you know, which is not ideal, but um, um, uh, well done, Fabio. Um, and <laughs> the nice thing was that those who actually felt it went well, they were actually talking about the support they received. And uh, you'll see in, a quote, in the quotes in a second, um, they were talking about the fact that little things like having a small talk when they come in. And a lot of Shians actually mentioned that, you know. So we like, I will get Shians in, just let them see it and say, well, is this your final exam? Do you, or how much more do you have to do? Um, did you have your breakfast this morning? And, you know, and, and a lot of them really appreciated this very simple thing, you know, uh, which is something you cannot do in, in an exam venue. I, you know, Sometimes I actually work in this huge exam venue. So I got 250 students in my introductory macroeconomics module. And you can smell the fear. And you can see their eyes. You know, they're just buying at you like, what are you doing to us? And I said, well, I'm sorry. And, <laughs> and but, you know, it's so lovely that you can actually talk to them and, and just sort of give them a pat on the shoulder without compromising the seriousness of the assessment they're about to undertake. You know? so, so that's quite nice. Yeah? And, and so negative comments, so comments from, it's not negative comments, but comments from students who didn't feel they did that well, say, well, no, I didn't prepare, or you asked me question outside the feedback you gave me, and I say, yeah, but I told you so. Um, um, but other ones, they actually recognize the value of the Viva, and, and, and I think this is, uh, this is really lovely. Um, so this one, yeah, gave meaning, yeah, opposite to dump knowledge. I say, that's brilliant, I love that. But I love that as well, you know. The conversation triggered memories that I didn't think I have. I really, I really uh, recognized myself in that. You know, so many times I went into an oral exam saying, oh my God, you know, this is going to be shambles. This is going to be a disaster. And then, you know, I will sit there, get comfortable. People ask me questions and I will nail it. Yeah? And, you know, something comes to your mind. You know, the challenge itself is just giving you that adrenaline rush and you're selling yourself. Yeah? Always perform better oral exams than uh, written exams, personally. Um, so not bad, not bad at all. Now, uh, this, uh, we are going to end up on a flat note. <laughs> um, so orientation to feedback, this is my challenge. So different colors are different aspects. So, so we got, for those of you who cannot read, we got the utility of feedback. We got accountability, how accountable I am about what I'm doing. Um, how people around me are actually helping me make sense of my feedback, including my lecturer, and self-efficacy, so the confidence, yeah? So you got marks versus the scale. Nothing. So there is no pattern there whatsoever, yeah? Um, so, uh, so this is my challenge, and I'm starting to reflect on what, what can I do to make it better here. So students, in their self-assessment, in their self-evaluation, they, they, they're actually recognizing what is going on. But when it comes to the, you know, taking an objective measure of their literacy and, you know, what's their attitude towards feedback, um, the pattern is pretty much random, you know. So, um, uh, well, this is not great, uh, but I'm not ashamed to uh, showing you because I, I still need to make sense of it. My rough guess is that, um, you cannot build assessment literacy or feedback literacy with just one module. And there should be like an holistic uh, way of addressing this. Well, what's your hypothesis here? Why Sorry? did you choose those two against each other? I mean, it's data that you have. What would it have told you? And well, you know, I would have wanted to see that uh, their mark, and especially, so I had two dimensions here. I have the mark they get in the conversation, yeah. And then I have the specific item in the rubric about response to feedback, how well they address the comments I gave them. Yeah. So, you know, um, you know, this is my assessment of how, how, how they worked. So you just want to see a correlation between their performance and their attitude towards feedback. So students who actually have a better attitude towards feedback, they should score higher. Whereas this cloud is telling you that even those who score high you know, some of them, they don't have that awareness, so they're, they're, they're feeling about feedback. You don't take into account a starting point. So yeah. if, you, if you were to, to, I don't know how you do that, but you, yeah. if you were to control for, yeah. actually their essay was quite good, yeah. or their essay was marginal, 
No, yeah. we call it average, sorry. Yeah. The, or that the, the RSA was rather wanting. Yeah. If you were to control for that, I wonder if you see yeah. that. I mean, that, um, to be honest with you, uh, is something that I did uh, uh, the first year. Um, but it was very dangerous because then my valuation will just be affected by the marks of the essay. So what you want to evaluate here is despite how good or bad your essay is, what you're going to do out of the feedback that I'm giving you. you know? So I, I agree that there is a scale effect that the starting point might actually have a, an influence, but I don't want to look at it. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Isn't, isn't what you want to measure the change in the mark? From let's say the early piece of yeah. assessment to that final mm -hmm. piece of assessment. Not because the assessment is different. You know, in the first assessment, it's it's what they do once I give them feedback on their piece. You know, so their ability to take their feedback on board. So the essay, that second piece, mm. the feed, the value of the feedback will, will, will be the ex and their response to it with the extent to which they raise their mark from that piece of essay to their conversation. Yes, but I mean the market conversation can go up, can go down. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. For, yeah. 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 Well, I can I can play a little. Yeah. A in I, I yeah I, 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 I obviously yeah and yeah with the observation I have um, the other thing I can do and this is more on Gwen's point is that I can um, um, so this measure I can deploy this measure at the beginning of the module and at the end of the module and this year I'm doing this so I'm taking the measure twice through and see whether there is a change within the module. I don't have very high expectations, but I'm going to try. The other thing is I need to do is just looking at their own self-assessment. So forget about the scale and just look at how they rank. It went better than expected, worse than expected, and just looking at that. Um, and that can give me some sort of indication. Mm -hmm. But any ideas are more than welcome. I'm actually done, so any sort of questions or suggestions about this, more than happy to take them. But Fabio, we don't want to assess their the, diff the change in their attitude to feedback going through. Is that not useful to look at? Because because what you're doing no. here is you're embedding feedback in your process yes. and making the feedback yeah. more useful. Yeah. So would it be interesting to look at their attitude to feedback as they start the process? Yes. Yes. And their attitude. Is it, yeah. Is that yeah. That's what I, I need to do. Like two points measurement: one at the beginning of the module, right now, and yeah. one at the end. Because that one of yeah. the things we're trying to do here is to make yeah. them more. And already looking at that change can actually tell me something. Yeah. 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 Because that's one of the things I get about from employers is that students are, work students in particular, are impervious to feedback. In the world of work. One and two. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for that. First of all, it's it, it's great to see something that's evidence based, and is it actually rather inspiring in terms of what you're saying? And the results are starting to. Um, demonstrate that. I think the other thing is that you, it's got, you're heralding something here because our, the existing process is, we, I think we have to recognise we've got a broken process using um, essays, um, and marking essays, and what you've done is to start to overcome that, and it's broken in the way that tutors are spending time sitting in dark rooms when they rather, when um, the students want to be interacting with the tutors and the tutors want to be interacting with them, and that is the one thing that you've picked up and you've actually demonstrated how for the same amount of time, yeah. you can overcome that. Yeah. And so that, that's, a, that's yeah. a major step forward in terms yeah. of demonstrating the process is broken. And then the other one, certainly for here, in that the process is broken and we've got to do something, is that once you've given somebody an essay to write, they don't have to go far before they um, can find a contract writer uh, or they can start plagiarizing. Yes. And that's absolutely true. And what that then ends up with is that the PMA or the essay is put in and goes through um, um, Turnitin or something like that and then we have to have an inquest where we sit in a room and accuse people of cheating and it creates a punitive uh, atmosphere that pervades the whole of the um, study period. Yep. Um, what you're doing is recognising that these, these processes are broken and it's an innovative approach mm. to say well they've had enough of this and you're moving into something which appears to be far more positive and inspiring for both the tutors and the um, students, so thank you for that. Thank you. Can I second that? This is this is fabulous stuff. Um, I have a couple of points. The first sure. one is technical. Yeah. Um, so how are you defining self-efficacy? Because you mentioned the word confidence. And yes. For me, that's not quite yes. So, so um, confidence, you know, so I can be a confident person, as you see standing here, 
uh, but I, I'm not confident at driving. So self-efficacy is a much more focused construct than confidence. It's confidence at doing something specific. Yeah? Um, so self-efficacy is the confidence at performing specific academic tasks. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and self-efficacy can change from maths to humanity, so lots of, you know. So, so can, can I challenge yeah, that sure. slide? And that's just coming from, that's mm. coming from a very pedantic professional no, no, perspective. By all means. To me, self-efficacy is about um, believing that you have the ability to change uh, to change the status quo mm -hmm. or what's going yeah. on in accordance with your goals. Mm -hmm. So it's not quite the same thing, and I'm not sure it's yeah. quite tapping into what your students might be experiencing. I see. So, but, it, but I mean, if you at some point I can bore you with that and. You know, Oh, please, if, and if you got other tools, uh, no, no, that, 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 that would be great. I mean, uh, the, 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 the literature on academic self-efficacy is, like, is providing a definition in the way I, 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 s I sold it to you. Uh, but there is a huge debate. Oh, oh and I entirely agree. And um, there is a fantastic paper by uh, Paharis, who passed away, but uh, where he actually questions the fact that people have measured all sorts of things, meaning self-efficacy. So, um, and uh, he, he analyzes one by one. So I'm aware, I'm aware of the of the problem. So, so I'm very, very open to different di different suggestions. Yeah. Yes. It's really worth our conversation because what yeah. what, what you uh, relate to in terms of self-efficacy in our field is quite often called metacognition. Mm. Which again is actually something really different. Which is yeah, yeah, something really different. Yeah. Well, so there is a there is yeah. a you know you you, yeah. need, you you almost need a glossary of in no. my in my language that means this yeah. and in yours. <laughs> but I I, I yeah. have to say yeah. I, I do struggle with that term. So I have to see. I mean, I'm not talking about locus of control. So for instance, in this context, is just the way the scale is built and the way they call it. So um, you know, it, it's not Fabio here. You know, but okay. um, right. you know. Um, no, 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 by all means, you know, no, by, by all means, you know, um, we, we, I'm, I'm fully aware that there is a huge debate about that, so, you know, but at the end of the day, some, you know, you just go for it and test at some point. Is that a, <laughs> is that a 2010 Lindau? Is, that a, is it Lindau or Lind, uh, uh, Linda Baum? Is that yeah. a 2010 scale you've used? Uh, let me check, we got it here. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Linda Baum, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the way they label it. One of the one of the dimensions. Yeah. Labeled self advocacy. The other thing I wanted to mention sure. to you, this is which is a professional development thing, I guess, yeah. and the pressures that we're all under as uh, pedagogical experts, specialists, what have you, as well as, as, well as subject specialists. Um, you had a wonderful quote. This is the scariest thing I've ever done. Um, <laughs> when I hear students say something like that, my little eyes light up, mm. and I have to really quell that because it's like. I'm I've, I've really pushed you, I've challenged you, I've mm -hmm. made you think. I have had criticism thrown at me. You know, that was so hard, Liz, you've made me think. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that's what you're here for! <laughs> but we also contend with this continual appraisal of mm -hmm. what we do, and it tends to turn more into a bit of a popularity contest. Easy, high yeah. marks, makes your module popular. Oh, yeah. And if you do something that scares your students, takes them out of their comfort zone, then you will know about it. Yep. And how do you balance those two? I mean, you said it, you said a great thing was like, oh, I don't care. Yeah. I'm really sorry. I still care. I'm still junior. Care. I'm going to put my teaching director hat on because that, that is the one according to which I have to give the answer. So I'm at okay. I'm, I'm a stage in my career where, you know, I really don't care. You know, I just do what I think is right. And or I care. You know what are the pedagogical outcomes, but I don't care about uh, beauty context any longer. Um, but, mo but as a teaching director, the first thing I did when I stepped up was scrapping the weight on uh, student evaluation and telling my colleagues that uh, you know I see innovation, any kind of process, with or without technology, because very often technology is seen uh, as as a race apart. You know, it's like with or without technology that produces a change for the better, and and it, it implies having a chat with me, changing. Uh, evaluating the results and perhaps agreeing that we are back at square zero and we are n you know, we're never going to do it. And I told my colleagues, you're not going to be penalized for that. If you engage with me at the beginning of the process and we discuss that, if it goes uh, uh, legs up, um, it's fine. Absolutely fine by me. And, uh, and, 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 and I'm actually going to reward you and I'm going to take into account in your progression uh, evaluation. Um, so once you set the criteria right, uh, then people start little by little to come to your office and and, and ask for advice, you know. So, so, but yeah, you, you, you need the leadership to be on that side. You, you know, as, as economists well know, it's all about incentives. If you set the right incentive, <laughs> if you set the right incentive, if people people are just going to 
follow